So the von Neumann architecture that's prevalent in computing today, you think is not really enough to get us there um, with artificial intelligence. We need a more um, distributive approach or parallel approach. So, yeah, if we comes. look at the history of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, it was you know um, there was a lot of really great. Uh, big picture visionary thinking and claims in the 60s uh, in the Herbert Simon uh, Newell era, uh, Alan Newell. Um, but um, we went into an AI winter in the 70s and 80s because of all the overpromise and because uh, the machines that we were using, the von Neumann architecture, the symbolic based approach, um, rule based approach, even with Bayesian. Um, probability added, it's not very biologically inspired. It's not the way we think. We don't do Bayesian priors in our head to uh, make a decision. So we do something more intricate and interesting that we're still in the process of decoding that's highly associational. And uh, computational neuroscience uh, is going to help us there. Um, imaging is going to help us. Uh, cellular molecular biology, developmental biology. Uh, genomics, proteomics, connectomics, as our uh, sciences of uh, human computation get better, we'll understand how to make a more biologically inspired machine, and that's very exciting. I would say Watson, going up against uh, the two best Jeopardy players a few months back, um, and beating the pants off of them, uh, basically did that using something that is a significant step beyond the uh, rule-based symbolic uh, way of doing AI. It was it's, uh, machine learning algorithms uh, working with a statistical um, graph network-based um, type of AI, associational AI, um, connecting up tens of millions of web pages and looking for patterns in a network-like structure that's uh, weakly similar to the way we think our brain works with uh, networks and Hebbian learning and these associational weighted synaptic networks. Uh, it's not strongly biologically inspired, but it's certainly a big step forward from what we had in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And I believe that type of architecture that we saw with Watson is probably the next generation of the web. It's the next level beyond PageRank, which Google uses, which is a very weakly biologically inspired as well. Um, but it has these additional features of, of uh, feedback and uh, uh, just a huge amount of um, uh, kind of an algorithmic core and a huge amount of, uh, of uh, kind of statistical corpus of knowledge that it, it is um, um, discovering. And it's really, it was almost cute watching Watson learn, like a, like, a, like a baby, and watching Watson make a mistake on Toronto, if you remember that famous mistake where um, Watson thought Toronto was in uh, the United States, and everybody chortles, oh, ho, ho, ho. Well, it turns out there's like 13 Torontos in the United States, and there's probably only one in Canada. And Watson just wasn't smart enough to recognize that the one in Canada, because it's almost a fifth of the population of Canada, was statistically more important than the 13 little tiny Torontos in, uh, in the United States. So just add a few little bits more kind of associational intelligence, the proper weightings, if you will, in the network, and the system just gets smarter and smarter and is more uh, like... Um, like a, uh, a living organism. And I think uh, the science of connectomics is going to uh, do that for us, being able to understand how every neuron connects to every other neuron in a developing and a developed brain and a learning brain, uh, which I think is going to come out of uh, um, the imaging and the electron microscopy and the automated circuit tracing um, uh, tools that are now moving into the neurosciences, neuro neuroinformatics, um, I think that's going to be really exciting. So we'll go to a world where um, we have these weakly um, mammalian intelligent um, simulations 
in hardware and or in software of these simple mammals that have all these higher order features like uh, morality, um, pair bonding, um, pack relations. Um, I could see a world where perhaps 20 years from now where we've instantiated these connectomics maps into these into these more strongly biologically inspired AIs and we're uh, we're pruning them we're domesticating them we're artificially selecting them just like we've done with animals for 10 15,000 years and I, I like to say that uh, you and I can trust our dogs and cats with uh, small babies we can leave the room with them uh, almost every breed and when the breeds that we can't we know which breeds those are and that's just because we've had these maybe 1,000 selection cycles, 10,000 years of uh, just selecting the ones that are more emotionally symbiotic with us. And I think we'll do that with our AIs. And their brains are going to be just as much a black box as the brains of these domesticated animals. But we'll trust them because we'll have a previous history of interactions with them. And it'll be ethical to iterate various versions of them and select on them because they're not going to be human level. Uh, just like we can do experiments on uh, on, on on mice, and if if, if uh, the uh, subjects ethics subjects committees think we'll learn something from it, we'll be able to turn off a, a simulated mouse brain without an ethical question of whether we're killing it or whether it's worth killing it. And we will be killing it, right? But we won't be killing it in anything like the sense of a biological organism, where all of that unique knowledge is lost in a technological system, as Kurzweil and others say, Moravec a lot of information can be backed up. So you really aren't killing it, you're just uh, archiving it. So I think we're going to go to a world that's really exciting, where we have complicated, uh, near biological models in our robots, in our drones, in our um, platforms, uh, search uh, platforms, uh, and we'll relate to them in ways that are, um, let's say, game theory proven to work with collectives, large numbers of human beings. And so I'm, I'm quite optimistic, as uh, Matt Ridley would say in The Rational Optimist, that collectives of human beings are pretty stable, pretty resilient. They will police their moral deviance. Um, well, there's only a tiny fraction of them that will be moral deviants. And so, if you think about all of the games we play, the moral games we play, the algorithms, um, what um, my friend Werner Vinge might call uh, the um, gold, meta golden rules, um, what are the meta golden rules that are baked into our genes? Well, we have many of them. Uh, one example is. Uh, uh, I will try and trust my fellow humans first, but I try and verify. And if I catch them cheating, I will kick that person not out of the tribe, typically, but to the curb. I kick them to the edge of the tribe, and then I watch them closely for the next round. And if they are repentant, if they are penitent, if they want to try and change their behavior and, and get back in, then I let them slowly back in. And so that's a, that's a meta golden rule that almost every society, every uh, robust society uses. And if you don't have that, if you kick them right out, of the, right out, then all your rule breakers very quickly get kicked out of your society. You get these homogenized societies that don't learn. So uh, we want rule breakers. We want people that are uh, continually experimenting. And yet we have these algorithms that we are baked into our genes that... Uh, help us, uh, that give us moral instincts, uh, moral sentiments, as uh, Adam Smith would say, that are highly, positively, some game theoretic. So they increase the size of the pie, they increase the strength, of the interdependence, the intelligence, and the immunity or resiliency of the system. And I think that we all have to each make up our own mind about that, just how much of that immunity, how much of that interdependency is, uh, is in any complex system. Uh, and if there's not enough of it, 
then there's catastrophes that are waiting to happen. So we need to get smart enough to recognize that in biological systems and ecologies, in cultures, and in technologies. And the better we get at gardening that and jumping on top of the uh, um, self-balancing, self-organizing features of a system and uh, you know, giving them report cards and putting more energy and effort and uh, resources into improving the immunity of those systems, uh, the better we'll be prepared for all of the disruptions that are going to come, the negative, the sides of the disruptions.